And we are live. Welcome, folks, to the Survival Podcast 3233. This one will also be an episode of Bitcoin Breakout, episode 32. Though primarily today, we're going to be talking about a plant you've heard about from me quite a bit in the past, a plant that I grow here on my property. I use it as a fertilizer and as a mulch and as a compost aid. I feed it to my ducks. I feed it to my chickens. I feed it to my geese. I don't have cattle or anything like that, but pretty much as is a plant that can make us fertilizer, can make us energy, and everything that humans eat tends to eat azola as well. It's just an amazing plant, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute with our special guest that I'll bring on as soon as we get uh, through thanking our sponsors for the day and letting you know about them. I want to start out today with Paul Wheaton uh, has had some really amazing stuff available lately, and I brought a lot to you, but I don't know that I've been quite as excited uh, about any of his recent things as this one right here. I have uh, always been into seed saving and things like that. And I consider myself a pretty good seed saver. Uh, I've done some work with what we call land races where I've built, built things specifically for my property. I've been working with a certain strain of uh, jalapeno peppers now for 20 years, honestly. And uh, I learned so much from this two-hour seminar with Alan Booker's uh, this, th this guy is like genius level. This is like an epigenetics level, uh, course on plant biology and how to breed plants to adapt to your local region. And you know what it cost? 10 bucks. If it was three times as much, I wouldn't care. I watched it last night. I was listening to it again, getting ready with today's show prep. It just is absolutely awesome. It's definitely something that you want to check out for only 10 bucks. I'll probably listen to it three or four more times. Uh, next up today, our sponsor today, number two, is uh, the Ridge Wallet. I uh, I found Ridge Wallet quite a long time ago when one of their reps reached out and said they wanted to sponsor the show. It seemed more like a yuppie product to me or something like that. I, I wasn't sure about it. They said, let us send you one. I'm carrying one right now. I've been carrying it ever since I got rid of my billfold and put it in my pocket. It protects my identity. It's just a better way to go. They started out with a Kickstarter about six years ago. They're a huge brand now, still working with us. And they're also a really badass EDC company, all kinds of cool stuff. And of course, if you're a member of the MSB, you get 10% off everything that you would ever buy at RidgeWallet.com. With that, I want to introduce our special guest. I am not going to butcher his last name. I did hear him in a podcast with a fellow Bitcoin podcaster. And what caught my attention was that he was talking about a plant I love called Azola. His first name is Moses. I can pronounce that correctly. I'm going to bring him on with us now, and uh, he can tell us his uh, his first name himself. I'm sorry, his last name himself. And uh, uh, hey, Moses, how you doing? Oh, hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's uh, Moses and Sahonta Token. So it's it's actually just a, a clan name um, from okay. from my uh, from my tribe. <laughs> Very, very, very cool. So you are a descendant of First Peoples, and I think that brings a unique viewpoint into this. You also fit well with this audience that you're a Bitcoiner, you're an anarchist, and you're a permaculturist. And I want to kind of lead off the discussion in the realm of permaculture first. But before we dig into, you know, Azola and permaculture, can you just give us some basic background about yourself and, and how you got into what you're doing today? Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, so thanks for having me on here. I uh, appreciate the invite. Um, I, I've just been kind of, um, I've always been a sort of out of the box thinker, um, very first principles thinker. Um, I've been into ancestral health and sort of um, gone down the rabbit hole of, of, the, of the, the fraud medical system and, and the fraud food supply that we have. Um, and I did that a few years ago um, before I ever discovered Bitcoin or anything like that. Um, and before I really got into permaculture, I'd already discovered those things and, and I cured some some health issues that I had um, just by practicing these, these principles. And um, kind of once you understand that the medical system is lying to you, this is pre-COVID, I learned this, you mm -hmm. kind of go, oh shit, well, everything else is a lie too, downstream from that. Um, and, and so for me, that was kind of my, my entry into the realizations of clown world. Um, being First Nations, having the perspective also, I've always kind of, you know, had my my doubts about colonization and, and sort of the state. 
um, that's kind of how I became an anarchist was from the indigenous perspective of co- colonialization. Um, and, and I'm under the opinion that all people are indigenous. Uh, it's not a race thing. It's just that the natural state of humans is indigenous. And, and then we have this, this parasite, this organism called the state that emerges and it, and it changes the natural state of human beings, which is consent to, um, now co- coercion, right? Like it's being forced upon us. We have to, to comply and submit. Um, and it's, it always settles on violence, right? Of course. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of why I'm an anarchist. I believe that the natural state of humans is, is peace and, and consent. Um, and that's been distorted out of, out by the state, because again, just looking into the history of, of tribal peoples, um, we never, there's, n- there's no ruler. There's no, there's no rule ruler inside of a tribe. There's rules but there's no ruler. Um, no person holds intrinsic authority. It's always respect. It's merit based. Um, no position holds anything arbitrarily. And so <clears throat> without bureaucracy, without that legislative parasite, um, you don't see the same problems within a tribe that you do amongst the, the domesticated human. Um, and, 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 and I think that a lot of our problems as a society can be traced back to the disproportionate um, value placements that we have, right? Like the value in society is completely distorted because it's issued, not discovered from the top down. So, I mean, that's kind of my background. I'm, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a pleb. I have no credentials or anything like that. Um, I just, I just, uh, I'm a skeptic. I'm a clown world skeptic above all. <laughs> you know, there's, there's people that have been listening to the show for as, almost as long as it's been on 14 and a half years now. And when you just gave that intro, they're like, oh, I see why Jack brought this guy on because it's uh, it's like listening to myself phrase what I say all the time a little bit differently. I I agree with you that we're all indigenous and I also use the term native and I, I don't use that maybe in the way that people do politically. I use it in the way that I would describe a biological system that if I catch a trout out of a stream and I decide to keep that trout and I fillet that trout. It has bright orange fillets and it's kind of a smaller fish than the state would stock or something like that. I'm like, that trout's native. It was born here. It was born in this ecosystem. And I think it's incredibly important because if we're going to fix all the stuff that we have screwed up as a species, and I agree with you mostly due to the state, then we have to not see ourselves as separate and apart from the wilderness or from nature. Like we have this idea in our society today that like, well, the wilderness is over there, and nature's over there, and we're over here in the city or the town, and we are somehow not part of this thing. It's neocolonialism. That's what it is. Correct. Correct. I always say I'm as native as a deer. I'm as native as a snake. I'm as native as a rat. I'm as native as a fish. I'm as native as any other biological organism on this planet. The difference is we have within our cognitive ability – the ability to think forward and see what we're doing for personal gain or to improve things or to damage things. And I think that comes with a responsibility to like stop thinking about what I can get this week, this month, this quarter, and start thinking about what the hell we're leaving behind for our great grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like the history, like the legacy we're going to leave behind. Right. And this is a, this is an indigenous principle thinking in seven generations. Um, This is something that, you know, we used to do before colonialization, like everything that was discussed, everything that was done was under the understanding that, you know, every action we take has a consequence, not for us, but for our children's children's children. Um, and we knew that intrinsically as a culture for forever. Um, now in today's world, it's, it's trust the experts, right? It's delicate everything out. It's, there's never any personal responsibility. It just, everything gets delegated out. And that's how you are. You have massive corruption. Like the corruption is enabled. It, it's kind of like incentivized. It, 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 everyone kind of knows it doesn't matter what industry you're in. You intrinsically know there's deep, deep corruption that sort of runs the show. And and you better just keep your head down and, and not participate. And if you do participate, well, I guess it's because you want to you want to climb the ladder, right? Even in the corporate world, it's it's corruption that in, incentivizes the the hierarchy, so to speak, right? So. <clears throat> that yeah it's all downstream from our 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 we're just our, we're not in our biological environment we're not in our native environment everything has been um 
it's synthesized now. So because there's this biological imperative that's no longer being met, um, we see all this dysfunction everywhere in society on interpersonal levels, right? Like you see like the chronic um, abuse, like, like abuse amongst families, like domestic abuse, things like that. Chronic addiction, addiction is a big problem right now. I um, in any community anywhere, um, especially now with high level synthetic opiates and things like that. It's, it's a, it's a, it's the real pandemic, but that, <clears throat> that is all a symptom. It's not a cause. The cause is truly just our, our value placement is wrong. And, and we trust authority. We don't actually have any merit in our leaders. Our leaders are all um, scammers and fraudsters, essentially. To become a good politician, you have to be a good a good scammer. I want to talk mostly today about Azola and the projects that you're working on with it and what it can do for us. But I, well, this is also a Bitcoin breakout episode, and I want to talk about Bitcoin. But you just said something there that leads us into that perfectly. This is actually a shirt that I have in my swag shop that I have up on the screen. For those on the audio, it says, Bring Back Seventh Generational Thinking. And the B and bring back is the Bitcoin B. And that was something I came up with quite a while ago because I believe when we have hard money, we build long-term things. Uh, I first, when I first discovered Bitcoin, I kind of thought about my time when I was in the corporate world and I would uh, handle sales up in uh, New York City. I'd be walking around Manhattan. I would see these churches with these sculpted uh, outsides, like literally in granite, like some guy sat on a scaffold and hand chiseled this ornate, gorgeous, uh, artwork on the outside of this church in the 1800s and how we could never build anything like that in a fiat system. We can't make that investment that is designed to be there forever, right? To be there as long as possible. And so that was a big part of my Bitcoin truth, my Bitcoin uh, realization and, and going from not just being a Bitcoiner, but actually understanding the whole point of it. Wh wh where's kind of your uh, viewpoint coming from with uh, Bitcoin? Well, so I'm one of the one of those people that um, interacted with Bitcoin really early on, uh, like 2011. Actually, a roommate mining it um, on his laptop, um, and so back then coins didn't mean anything at all. They were completely obscure files, essentially, just you know dot dot files didn't mean anything. And so I, I had opportunity to get in super super early to the point where I was holding hundreds of, of different coins at, at, at different points. Um, and I never learned how to interact with them, how to use them, what they even meant, what they were, what their potential was. All of that I left off off the table. Um, and I, I kind of lost track of, of, of Bitcoin and what was going on. I, I obviously didn't keep any of those coins. So I was kind of one of those people that, that had the opportunity really early on. And then I dismissed it because it didn't, it didn't mean anything to me then. Um, and then it wasn't until 2018 that during the bull market, when everyone started talking about Bitcoin, um, that I kind of was like, oh, hey, wait a second, Bitcoin. I remember those. Wait, they're worth $20,000 now? And, and then I was bitter. I was just instantly bitter. And I was bitter for, for I, probably until 2020. I was actually um, I, sort of somebody who was like, good, I hope Bitcoin fails. Like, I think that's a, that's a scam and it, and it fell through. That, that was actually my original perspective on Bitcoin. That's, that's pretty interesting. And I, I think the people make a cross, whether it's, uh, a story like yours where they they kind of missed an opportunity, they got angry or they got in and they started to realize like huge returns, but then went through a bear market. But at some point, there's a shift between number go up and freedom go up. And I think that's when people really kind of go all in. And I don't mean just from a standpoint of like put all your money in. I mean, from a standpoint of truly deciding I'm going to understand the game theory. I'm going to understand uh, things like the Cantillion effect. I'm going to understand all of these things. And I'm going to realize that even though I thought I understood Bitcoin, I don't. And now I'm on a quest probably for the rest of my life to fully understand what it opens up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like now, so since 2020, that's when I really went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Um, there was a guy online, actually, a YouTube channel. It's still out there, still a really good YouTube channel. Shout out to Traders University. Um, but this guy, he breaks down the first principles on Bitcoin. Um, and, and I stumbled on his channel by chance and started listening to a lot of things he was saying. And then I, I went and I did the deep dive, you know, like the, I spent you know, pretty much constantly just been consuming content on it since, since I first discovered it. But I, you know, I went down and listened to the whole, you know, 21 lessons thing. And I did this and that and tried to like absorb all the in information out there. Cause there's some deep thinkers in the space that have really broke this stuff down philosophically um, and technically, and, and sort of did my best to understand it. I still don't fully understand Bitcoin technically. 
Um, I'm not a computer scientist, so I understand the premise. I, 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 I can explain the first principles. Um, <clears throat> but if you ask me to like get into the core code or something, I'm, I'm lost. Um, I, ru- I run a node, basic things like that, but it's not like, um, you know, I, I'm nowhere near like the, the Bitcoin development side of things or any of any of that. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting to me though, is of course, like you said, sound money and not just sound money, but actually what's, what's, what's more profound than sound money to me is post state consensus, the ability to actually reform consent outside of Dunbar's number. So before Bitcoin, actually, we've never, ever had the ability to do this as human beings. Like there's, there's literally no way to do it. Um, you, you, can, you can achieve consent within Dunbar's number. Um, and that's what a tribe is, essentially. And then outside of Dunbar's number, you either use, you know, some proxy to interface with that other group. Um, and generally that will rest on, you know, religion or, you know, spirituality, or there's usually some interface method trade oftentimes, um, that kind of enables some form of, of peace to exist between groups of people. And like, if you look at North America, we had a horn or hormesis, I would say here before colonization, where all the tribes sort of maintained a certain balance and a symbi- symbiosis within their environment in, in proximation to other tribes. Um, but now, since we have Bitcoin, we can actually expand that consent past our group without an intermediate party being the state, right, or a colonial force to, to force people together under threat of violence. I think that that's the real crazy implications of Bitcoin that go beyond just um, a value ledger. You know, it's interesting, too, when you bring up the word tribal, I think a lot of people, because of the way we've been educated, that immediately sets them to thinking about North American native tribes, where the truth is we are all in our genesis tribal. Europe was a tribal society before it became a state controlled society. You know, you could say the same for Asia. You can say the same for Africa. You can say for the North American, South America. And there were societies here of what we refer to as native americans today that went to the status level if you look at the maya or the mexia or something like that those were status societies and yet there was this coexistence of tribal society that didn't really want to be part of that and it's been pretty much the whole world has that there's there's always been anarchists no matter what the name is that they call themselves and i think that most anarchists in some way are tribalists as well. And I think that's where people have a breakdown and they lose concept of no rulers doesn't mean no rules. There's certain mm-hmm. ways that you treat each other, right? And if you don't, then you're not welcome here. But uh, there's more responsibility. There's more personal responsibility in a, in a society with rules and not rulers. Yes. Because, because in today's society, you can just delegate responsibility, you know, and, and you can't do that within a merit meritocracy. It doesn't exist. Like, like I think the the... The, the Vikings, you could even say, were almost like the last stand out against world colonialization, um, e- even more so than I think the Native, the Native Americans, because um, they actually tried to maintain a form of tribal society at, mm-hmm. at scale beyond their beyond their borders. Right. <clears throat> yes. And they fought the Christians. They fought the state. Essentially, they were the last I would almost say the last holdout. Um, and then if you actually carry that out today, you could go, you go to the mountains of Afghanistan um, and, you, and you see what's going on there to today. It's anarchists that don't want the U.S. government to come in and, and determine their, their way of life at a, at a core principle. I think that's, that's what we're seeing. It's still, you know, this is Russia and Ukraine. It's, it's not Russians versus Ukraines. It's the state versus the peoples and the peoples become the collateral damage of the two states at, at, at war. Yeah, my, my grandparents are first-generation immigrants from Ukraine, and I can tell you that you, what you just said is 100% spot on. Nations nations go to war, people fight them. That, that's the way that goes. Uh, moving on to permaculture, um, how long have you been interested in permaculture and what led you into that world? I'm a huge pothead, so that's kind of how I got into permaculture, just being a pothead. Um, going to, going, going to hippie events, talking to hippies, um, being kind of in that world, the counterculture world. Um, yeah, permaculture to me has just always been a no brainer. Um, as far as like how we produce our food, this is like, again, indigenous food knowledge, things like that. Everything used to be permaculture, the way ever all of our food was gathered was permaculture. Um, 
like like the way we would hunt our deer, you know, for example, we'd actually do a deer hunt pretty much once a year. It'd be like an annual deer hunt and we'd preserve, we'd preserve the meat otherwise. Um, and the whole community would come out and they would hunt, they would hunt it. They would basically, we would spread out across the forest in a big group and we just walk through the forest, the whole tribe. And they would basically encourage the deer into these natural corrals that we would build in the forest where they could then be harvested in, in a central, in a, like a center, center spot. And we always left the opportunities for the deer to get out, right? They weren't like fences necessarily. It was just like that became the, the route of least resistance. So that's most likely where most of the deer would go. So it was very, very efficient the way we used to harvest our food, the way we used to grow our food, right? Like the three sisters, things like that. Like this is all permaculture concepts. It's like, how do you put the least amount of effort out? And how do you actually get the most return for the least amount of effort? I think that's the core principle in permaculture is 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 that like um what you're getting in return for the for what you're exchanging as far as energy goes because a real perma uh, an effective permaculture system is better than an agriculture system and it's better than a gathering hunting system because you're you're kind of hybridizing the two of them you're letting the natural system do all of the care for you and the tending for you and then you're just coming through and, and reaping the benefits essentially yeah i mean i've been reading uh, a lot of things on pre-colonial uh times i've been reading uh specifically right recently 1491 and one of the things that amazed me is there were literally laneways cleared from where the buffalo were in the central united states into yep. the southeast and northeast where buffalo were driven the so pound makers, though. Trade, the pound makers. <laughs> right? but that required trade and cooperation between multiple tribes because you don't just like roll in and do that unless you have some level of cooperation and then the, the animals that actually were on the East Coast, they could never get up to, not really the East Coast, but the North and Southeastern regions, they could never get up to the levels of population that they would have had in the Great Plains. It just isn't the same ecosystem. So they were harvested, you know, in moderate numbers so that they could be maintained prior to them being wiped out. Yeah, the, wood, the wood buffalo are actually a different subspecies entirely because of their their difference in in um, in area and in, in region. But it's funny you bring up the buffalo pounds out west. That's actually the avatar I've adopted online. Um, chief mm -hmm. Poundmaker. He's a he's a Cree chief. He actually fought the Canadian government um, and, and to have the to maintain and continue the rights to have buffalo pounds. Um, and to be able to have our traditional harvesting rights, because don't forget that the reason why there's no buffalo on the plains is because the governments decided that it was more beneficial to starve the natives out than it was to have that natural resource. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that, that we can go all kinds of crazy stuff like refuting uh, overkill hypothesis and whatnot. But I want I want to keep moving on the subject that we planned because, I mean, we're just in sync here on this. Um, want a little bit, though, on ancestral health. Because uh, I know that came up a lot in the interview that I listened to that you were on where I found you. What does that term mean to you? Yeah, I think really it comes down to the core principle that the natural state of the human organism is health and healthy. And we've been basically tricked into thinking that it's not, that we're basically at a default state of disease and we need all these interventions to prevent disease. Um, and it's actually the opposite way, I think, where our natural state is 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 whole and um, we have these interventions that come and dis disrupt our our natural biological imperatives. And then you have a mismatch where you have an organism that's in a um, an environment that doesn't match its biology. I mean, that's what the domesticated human is. So when you see the state of domesticated humans, you see chronic disease is very rampant. And the mortality curve is very shallow, which means that we kind of start withering away in our midlife. We don't actually live full vital lives until our, our, the end of, end of life, right? Which is the opposite, which is true in, in wild people. They, they say, oh, well, hunter-gatherers only live to be 20, 25 years old, but that's not true at all. It's bullshit. It's total bullshit. That's the, the mean age was brought down because of, of infant mortality specifically, um, as right. well as trauma, things like that that would take you out. Again, back to hybridization, there's a, there's, a, there's a way to move forward as a species where we combine the benefits of modern technology. No one's advocating for the Stone Age, um, but we also honor the biological imperative that we have as a species, and we live our life in accordance to those, that, that, you know, those, those, those rituals and those, those, those sort of um, tenets that, that, 
that create a whole um, organism. So I think ancestral health is not just like the type of meat you eat or whether you're a carnivore or a whatever, or any of those sort of like modern terms. I think it's more to do with just recognizing that the natural state of human is healthy. And if all we, if the only thing we can do, and, and again, about getting the most reward back for the least amount of effort, hunter gatherers spend most of their day kicking it. They don't work very hard at all. <laughs> um, and, and that's because they they understand how to how to basically get the most out of their environment for the least amount of effort. The same goes with the human health, like going and killing yourself in the gym and, and doing all these things to me um, has diminishing returns. If you look at athletes, for example, athletes tend to burn out quickly, things like that. Cause I don't think that that's necessarily peak human performance, even warriors of old, they're only going to fight war once a year. They're not necessarily out there killing themselves every single day. They may train for war, but they're not going to, you know, put their body under that stress every single day. So I actually don't even really work out. I just spend a lot of time out walking barefoot in nature. I'll carry heavy things or I'll do this or I'll do that. And I've actually realized that my, my body responds way better to just mimicking ancestral patterns than it does to going in the gym and, and, and grinding out a specific routine. Um, well, I, if you look at any animal other than human beings, no animal engages in repetitive motion. Right, like on an ongoing, consistent, scheduled basis, like in, in I'm never do ten bench presses, ten inclines, ten declines, twenty hammer curls. Like no animal does this except us, and yet they're all perfectly healthy and strong. I don't think any of us would want to. I don't know. Challenge if a deer could mentally understand what it was supposed to do. Just a a young doe yeah. to a wrestling yeah. match, he would kick our ass. Right. Gorillas really sit on their ass all day and eat vegetables, yeah. you know, and they're jack. So it's, it, <laughs> yeah. And I don't want to put down weightlifting or whatever because I've seen it do amazing things for some people, but sure. I'm not, I'm not that dude either. I've got from living a pretty rough life with kind of an adventurer type attitude and being in the military in the past, some damaged joints and things like that. And some strength training is helpful, but also can be uh, detrimental if done to excess. So, yeah, I'm I'm pretty b- big on that with you. Let's talk about the the main subject today, Azola. Uh, we kind of talked about your background now. Somewhere along the way, you had to discover this plant that I've been talking to this audience about uh, on and off for about seven years now. I think it's an amazing plant. How did you discover it? What was it about it that made you say, "Hey, there's something more to this than just a, a plant that floats on water"? So I actually approached this from a first principle principles perspective. I discovered Azola because of what it could do, not not the other way around. Um, I didn't know about Azola and then discover what it could do. Gotcha. Um, so I've had this idea for a while um, about energy, um, and I and just again just kind of like stoner conversations with with a couple friends. I have a friend who's an electrical engineer, um, and we used to sit there and think about how you can create energy at the lowest cost. Um, using the most primitive primitive technology. So obviously there's nuclear and, and there's these other solutions, um, zero point energy and like these things that they're working on, fusion. Um, there's these far out sort of gate kept solutions, but there's n- there isn't a widely available solution that kind of is low tech and, 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 and very apparent. So I used to sit there and I used to think about it. We used to talk about it and we used to really think that this was for a long time we used to think that okay there's there's a way to to produce hemp within a biosphere that is going to exceed the cost of input from an energetic perspective and you're going to get excess energy out of the process because if you bring up bioenergy with most people they'll have a knee-jerk reaction and they'll say oh that's a that's a that's a um a deficit it's gonna it's gonna be a deficit Right, because they're thinking, oh, you need to have natural gas, Haber Bosch method. Then you have ammonia-based fertilizer. Then you have tractors, and you're spraying it all over your field. Then you're harvesting corn, and then you're running it through an industrial ethanol processing plant, and all these things. Like, yeah, that's a deficit, but that's sort of clown world subsidized uh, biofuel. It's not real bioenergy. You're not actually gaining anything energetically. And so, for a long time, I thought that this was potentially hemp. Um, and then, um, I just kind of, I never really did anything with that. Just thought about it and uh, had those long conversations, but that's, that's what laid the prerequisite for me in my mind. Um, and then since discovering Bitcoin and learning about Bitcoin, I I started to really be intrigued by the energy consumption process of Bitcoin mining and thinking that, oh, Hey, there, there's a lot of energy and food waste. 
Um, and food waste has BTUs with it, associated with it. And, and it's actually widely discarded. Everyone just throws food waste out. And even if you have a municipal collection program, it's also a deficit and it's also kind of gimmicky, right? People don't necessarily engage with it. They're not incentivized to engage with it. They throw garbage in it or they just throw the food in the garbage. So I thought, well, this would be amazing if you could actually capture all this food waste and mine Bitcoin off of it, you would have an incentive margin to be able to actually incentivize the collection of clean food waste because you could just pay people a small amount of, of Bitcoin for it because it would be it would be worth that. Um, and then I started looking more into it and I realized that's actually not possible because the deficit required to collect the food waste, right? Because food waste weighs a lot. So the, the process of going around and collecting all the food waste, bringing it to a location, converting it into electricity, mining Bitcoin, you're already at a deficit because of the collection process. So I said, damn, you know, there's got to be something you can feed this shit to that would yeah. exponentially increase its potential, you know, the, the potential of the plant. And so I, I just Googled, I literally opened up Google and I typed in fastest growing biomass. That's what I looked up. And lo and behold, the answer was, as you know, Azola. Azola is the world's fastest growing biomass. So that kind of fact alone that it's the fastest growing biomass led me down the route of what is this plant what does it do how does it grow what is the life cycle and then once i saw that it did all these things i remember sitting there reading about it kind of like jumping up from my chair and like having like a, a manic moment like this is incredible how do we not use this everywhere already this plant is actual magic you can you can essentially give it sewage and it's going to grow like it, it's it, it's wild this plant and and the, the the possibilities and the capabilities and everything like that and then i started looking at all the research behind azola and lo and behold all the research drops off a cliff in the 80s like they there's so much potential in this plant we're looking into this plant we love this plant this and that universities funding the research this and that and then all of a sudden in the 80s no one even knows anything about it anymore no one hears about it anymore and, and what happened during that decade in, in the research world, specifically like plant research, is genetically modified organisms became the, the new push, the monetary push. So all of the research shifted over to GMOs and like um, in the industrial agro, agro complex and how they made those companies more money. So those companies didn't look at Azola and see any profit margins or any profit potential in the plant or in the... Um, intellectual information around genetically modifying the plant they didn't see their potentials that they saw in corn or they saw in these other plants so there's just no funding for it the research from money dries right up um, and azola sits on a shelf filipino farmers use it for for three decades and um now if you see there's new renewed research into it but again it goes back to these highly technological gate kept solutions behind renewable energy etc 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 they do recognize it as oh this plant's probably the universal feedstock for biofuel there's this there's that and the other thing but there's not real there's no real push for the use of it because they haven't figured out how we're going to gatekeep this plant yet how we're going to put this plant inside of our esg narrative and we're going to have our compliance certificates and this that and the other thing they haven't figured out how they're going to do all that yet so they haven't pushed azola yet but if you if you are fixated on carbon emissions and you want to remove carbon from the atmosphere, Azola is the number one way to do it because it quite literally pushed the world into an ice age a million years ago by doing the exact same thing. You know, um, one of the things that's really amazing about this plant, and for those that are in the video, I've got a, a screen up right now, is where it is already. So somebody was asking before you even uh, came into the room, dude, like, I live up in, I remember if it was Michigan, Wisconsin or whatever, you know, how can I grow it? Do I have to bring it inside? Well, maybe. Um, I grow it here in Texas. We do get, believe it or not, really cold weather here. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had five inch thick ice on my tanks that I grow Azola in. And some of them are only 11 inches deep. And how it survives under the ice, I don't know. And how long I can do that, I don't know. But the ice melted. There was a little bit of green flex here and there. When spring came, it came back all by itself. Um, I always bring some into my indoor tanks and all as a safeguard. But if you're, if anybody can see the screen right now, we're talking well down south into South America to where we're into equivalent climates to like zone five, zone six USDA, uh, all the way up the coast of British Columbia into the okay. northeastern United States, all through Europe, all through Asia, 
the southern half of Africa, Australia, like there's plants everywhere. And for one reason or another, the powers that be, the state have not declared this thing anywhere I know of in America anyway as an in, invasive species. Yeah, right? I have actually Florida. Florida, it's illegal to it's illegal to grow in Florida. Well, good luck with that, because the Florida climate, it's gonna do it. That's where that's where I, I was gonna go. So I get another plant that I work with, it's illegal and it's called water hyacinth, and it's an amazing plant as well. And it when if, if I ever lose mine, I always get it from a guy in Florida where it's also illegal to grow. He just runs down the canal, pulls it out, throws it in the mail and sends it to me. Right. Yeah, that's so, why it's illegal. It's because it's quote unquote invasive, right? So they yeah. they don't want it to plug up waterways. So you're not allowed to um, grow it. Like you're not allowed to cultivate it. See, this is the problem we have. We have a native species we've called invasive, right? So uh, it's the scientific name is Azola Carolina. So you can figure out where its indigenous range is. Um, but most people, my my bigger point is, most people without any kind of special uh, permission slip from the state can work with this plant right now they don't have to beg for it or whatever some of the places i order plants from they're like oh you're from texas we can't ship to you we're a licensed nursery i've never had that problem with the zola and uh the other thing about it is it actually seems to me to be way more some people say duckweed is the the fastest reproducing plant but i grow both of them i love both of them duckweed can't keep up with the reproduction rates of the zola at the right times of year where the temperature is kind of in its sweet spot and it's a much larger plant, and it fixes nitrogen. Um, so if we can kind of, like, let's pick this thing apart and start out with the different uses for it. Like you mentioned in the Philippines, it's still a very big part of their agriculture. And it's a plant that is basically a, a nitrogen-fixing fern. So it can pull, nit- like, most plants can't get nitrogen out of the atmosphere. It's their primary nutrient they grow on. And this is kind of frustrating when you think about it because it's, it's something we put so much effort into providing to plants. And it's the most abundant thing in our atmosphere. But Azola can fix that nitrogen and it can use other biomass as its other nutrient and it can produce as much nitrogen as you could want. And I literally oh, just take handfuls of it, put it on my, my plants for fertilizer. And what I've noticed, and I think this is the really exciting part, the more you harvest it, the more you get. Like it actually does slow down if you let it completely fill up uh, whatever you're cultivating it in. But if you take no, no more than about 60% a shot, it reproduces itself very rapidly and you can get more for whatever use you want. It's magical. It's, it's actual magic. It's, it's wild because it, it, what I say it is, it's a BTU multiplier. So if you have animal manure, animal manure has a certain amount of BTUs. If you have food waste, it has a certain amount of BTUs. Now you take that and you add it to an aerated water system and you grow a Zola on that water system. And if you can, like you said, harvest it at the right frequency to keep the growth rate growing, you can then take that original amount of BTUs and then over an amount of time, potentially 20 times it. Because a Zola will grow in sterile water, right? But it won't grow very well. But right. if you add it to nutrient water, where it's going to take some of, the, some of its biomass from the water itself, the nutrients in the water... Azola, they've done the numbers on this. It's growing 95% of its biomass from fixated nitrogen, which means that that's 20 times multiplier. It's only taking 5% of its biomass from the available nutrients in that whatever you gave it originally. So I, th- I think it's going to potential, the potential for, for energy and, and animal feed and, and just having it as a core um, feed supply for whatever operation you're running whether you're you have a citadel you have a ranch or you have a for-profit cattle farm you know a dairy farm whatever it is i think that this this plant could be plugged into all these agricultural operations and i believe that there's a modular solution that can actually bring this to the northern climates and the cold climates as well and using bitcoin miner heat um to to keep water warm things like that using the gasification process using geothermal energy to, to build buildings like earthship style buildings that, that are efficient, that don't need a lot of energy to stay warm, things like that. I think that the, the future of um, renewable energy is actually bioenergy based and not just Azola because Azola can be fed to other plants like hemp. Um, if you have a lot of wood on your property, you can be using wood for this process. Um, but bioenergy is the key to unlocking energy independence 
much more than solar, much more than oil, much more than any other other form of energy. Um, because it, you, the, the state can tell you you can't pull oil out of the ground. The state can tell you you can't pull coal out of the ground, but they mm-hmm. can't tell you that you can't burn your lawn grass. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's all these, these these things that it just makes it harder to control. And then if you have a surplus of energy, then you have a surplus of economic freedom and everything is downstream from energy. Definitely when you you have a surplus of energy, you have a surplus of freedom. That's uh, despite our problems. That's one of the things that, that's given humanity as much freedom as we have today is our energy surplus. Unfortunately, we're, we're pulling it from the ground at an unsustainable rate uh, and doing a lot of damage in, in the process. So, uh, but, th- but energy availability is key to humanity for humanity's freedom. What I look at when I see a Zola though, is a plant that grows in water. Okay. And it likes, in my experience, water between about 68 and about 85 degrees. That's where it's really freaking happy. And so I'm not talking about air temperature. I'm talking about water temperature there. And then water is like one of the greatest thermal batteries there is. It's not quite as efficient as Earth, but unlike Earth, I can move water. So if I have a heat source, I can move water around a water jacket back into a pond. Mm. Now I have a thermal battery, let's say, in a protected environment like a greenhouse, I can keep growing that stuff straight through the winter. And even if my air temperature in my greenhouse is just barely above, you know, freezing maybe in the 40 degree range during the evening, that's fine for growing all types of other crops, especially the crops that are the high turn, uh, high ROI crops like leafy greens, herbs, vegetables, and things like that. Because if you're growing, if you're growing corn in a greenhouse, I don't know what to say. I just go over there and don't bother me. So you end up with this, this plant that can actually produce energy and a byproduct of that energy, no matter whether it's a direct burn, uh, whether it's uh, gasification running a Bitcoin miner, no matter what it is, there's a byproduct of heat. And we can harness that heat and channel that heat back to grow more of the plant. Now, now to me, that's dramatically exciting because it's a plant that just – and then you know that water source – we could also do something like you were alluding to maybe using municipal waste streams to, to feed that plant, but it would be the simplest form of aquaponics there is. And many fish could actually be fed off of the plant as well. So it's like, there's all these closed loops and it's up to us to decide in any given system, exactly how do we engineer that system to maximize the goal of that particular system in that particular climate with that particular uh, flow of inputs and outputs. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And I see a solution for 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 water purification. Um, so up north in in a lot of reserves up north in in um, in Canada, we have third world living conditions. Kid you not? I believe you. And and, and it's it's terrible, and it's a huge grifting point for politicians, and has been for decades now, where they just go, oh, "We're going to fix the clean drinking water," and forever they're going to forever fix it and it's it to the point they'll build a plant and they'll actually people will live next to a water filtration like purification like plant and it doesn't run because there's no funding to run it isn't this wild this is the 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 beauty of the of the government and its peak peak capacity so it it's beautiful because there's now an opportunity to you can imagine building a a a living machine essentially that you can have a a geothermally um, static building, which is going, like I said, you're going to maintain temperature without a lot of inputs. And then you can grow this azola and you can stack it, of course, because you don't need very much water to grow in, in each tray. You can stack it so you can get a lot of volume growing inside of a small area. Um, and then you can supplement the light spectrum with LEDs, which don't require a ton of energy. Um, and there's no there's low sun up north during during the winter months. So you can actually supplement the the LEDs um, because again, as Ola does, it just needs shade. It doesn't need direct sunlight or anything to grow well. Um, and it, as long as you can plug in some form of, of nutrient source that's already available in the ecosystem, whether that's food waste or or something else, then then now you can you can create a surplus of biomass in this environment that you can convert directly into Bitcoin. So now they can grow funding within their own community without extraction technology so traditionally if you look at places like fort mcmurray right that's a the oil sands in canada and those erupted when they discovered oil 
And so you had a previously sort of isolated tribal population living in destitution and poverty that now have this massive influx of economic activity, which brings some good. But then it also brings with it a whole bunch of crime, a whole bunch of addiction, a whole bunch of all these other downstream effects that come from that extraction technology, right? Like you're going to have work crews coming in and like there's a ton of missing and murdered indigenous women that come from uh, like sex traffickers that target areas like this, that basically have this budding economic activity makes them ripe for harvesting. Literally, like there's a lot of like fucked up shit that happens um, and it happens sort of because you have a vulnerable population without their own native economic activity. So now you're able to bring in a native economic activity to an area that the biggest sort of economic activity is the black market alcohol. (laughs) That's pretty much the biggest economic activity otherwise. So you can, you can over, over basically um, create a new incentive structure. So people go, Oh, actually I want to participate in this new model and then becoming a part of those circular systems that you're talking about. Now you can do something like you can have a tribe in the tundra with previously no economic activity or real exportable resources. And now you can have native Bitcoin mining. You can also have native fertilizer production, native animal feed production, right? Because it costs so much to like, if you want to raise ducks or rabbits or something up there, it costs so much to import sure. things like food, right? So now you're able to produce all of those things on site. And now you can do something like indigenous uh, we can grow hemp without regulation, right? So what that leads to, the way that's capitalized on is basically um, gray market cannabis. So you have, you know, a ton of dispensaries on every reserve and they can grow weed however really they want and they can sort of distribute it however they want. It's sort of totally open, open range. So that has a cap, right? The market is only so big. So then that doesn't really bring economic prosperity to the place because if everyone's just buying and growing and selling each other weed, it's it's a capped market. It's only going to sure. go so big. So yeah. that's why the government doesn't care. They're like, well, do whatever you want with your weed. It's no threat to us. Um, but the real the real economic activity and, and, and opportunity here is in industrial hemp because industrial hemp is highly regulated and that's why it's the cost to produce is very, very high right now. But there's a large demand now for hemp products and hemp products aren't regulated. So if now you can produce fertilizer on site, you can then bring those sort of greenhouse structures and you can grow them larger and larger. You can start to grow hemp and you can start to process hemp and you can start to export hemp products. And this is now becomes a large drive, large driver for the economic activity of previously disenfranchised um, communities. It doesn't have to just be First Nations communities. But I think that like if citadels and ranches and things like that, I see a huge opportunity for Azola and Bitcoin mining to come into ranches. If you look at the, the way to grow a market inside of, um, you know, say you're growing grass fed bison, for example, you want to bring that grass fed bison, you want to sell it to to directly to consumers because the, the cost of going through butchers and all these uh, third parties, it doesn't add up on the margins. So you really want to direct a consumer model. That's a low time preference model. It takes a long time to build. You have ongoing costs in between. So what happens is a lot of farmers are stuck going, okay, well, shit, I have to actually rent all this land out to soybean farmers. They're going to spray spray, spray glyphosate on them because it's part of their contract to do so um, with the seed company. And then I'm going to get that land back in eight to 10 years. And then I'm going to have to run I'm going to have to run uh, bison on it without actually being able to harvest those bison because I got to replenish the land and, and, and worry about the glyphosate ha- uh, half-life and all these things. Like there's, there's so much that goes into the economic activity of a ranch that's trying to um, go to market with its product. Like uh, for example, the reason I said that example is I actually know somebody who was a live bison ranch for 25 years. They acquired an abattoir, like a, 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 a licensed facility to to process their meat and go direct to customer. And so trying to grow that market now is actually the largest challenge mm. because they have ongoing costs while simultaneously trying to grow a market. So things like this, I think, are the real opportunity for Azola is plugging it into operations like this. And then the energy aspect of this of Azola, because you're able to in the same place, keep renewably true renewable energy because you're, you're renewably harvesting the same area over and over and over again to produce electricity that you're monetizing directly through Bitcoin mining. 
covering your margins and then building your market. So, you know, I think that's, there's a lot of opportunity for otherwise disenfranchised groups to capitalize off of the um, cultivation of Azola. So let's, uh, let's, before we dig into using Azola as a fuel, basically a pelletized dried fuel, let's not skip over some of the things that you hit there. One, we, we talked about fertilizer and I think people get that if it fixes nitrogen, and it has nitrogen, and we put it with plants, then the nitrogen is not just nitrogen, it's, avail- it's highly bioavailable nitrogen. It's in the form that plants want to use. But the middle part there was you mentioned livestock feed and how expensive it is to feed animals like rabbits or what have you in a climate like you're talking about. And in many instances across the, the United States and Canada, uh, there's many uh reservation lands that are very poor quality land regardless of the climate it's like you know we didn't as a people the 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 europeans and then early americans didn't decide let's give the natives who were here first the best that we gave them (laughs) what we didn't want i mean just to be blunt and so there's a real problem there and what i have up on the screen now is a, a zola meal so this is a dried number so when we dry the 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 plant out And people throw out numbers all the time. And I hate that because how you grow a plant is going to directly attribute to what the protein content is. But most tests of Azola will test somewhere between 24 and 36% protein by weight. Until you get jacked rabbits. Right. That's huge. That's massive amount of protein. We we look at soy putting about 33% shitty quality protein into animal feed. And so if we can feed animals with this, that's the bigger part of the bill of animal feed is your high protein component of it. You know, with layers, we're looking for 18 to 20% protein. So we have something that can do that. And that's a huge thing for people that don't have any alternative other than have semi trucks bringing in very expensive feed. If they want to be able to raise livestock. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, that's what the Philippines do. That's what they do in countries where they don't have access to the Haber Bosch um method like i on the twitter on the twitter page i think in the bio i put azola versus haber bosch because like that's really what it is like azola can displace the haber bosch method and 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 sort of um disconnect agriculture from the the oil and gas industry and like this piss some people off because you know oil and gas advocates sort of need that you know it's important that that, that food comes from oil and gas because it gives them sort of a credentials in the argument and i don't intrinsically hate oil and gas but and i'm not a carbon hysterical but there is environmental destruction and there is absolutely ecological damage and dysfunction that is downstream from the oil and gas industry plastics every all the petroleum products everything we use in our in our life can be replaced effectively with hemp and it isn't because there's there's obviously margins on the line and there's lobbies and everything like that involved so, I mean, if you really want to talk about the carbon crisis and, and you want to talk sorry, the, not the carbon crisis, the climate crisis, it's not a carbon crisis. It's, it's an ecological dysfunction from, yeah. from, from petrochemical pollutants. <laughs> That's the problem. So it's not just end oil now and all these bullshit ideological ESG narrative arguments. Those, those aren't, those aren't going to solve anything other than enrich the already rich cantillionaires. Like That's what ESG is for. It's for keeping the, the, the corrupt fox on top still on top that's the only thing it serves but as far as the actual earth and honoring the earth and and you know there's a lot of native groups fighting pipelines you know it's not necessarily because we hate pipelines it's because we don't want shit ruining land and water it's all about the water we're trying to protect water because we we were focusing on carbon and this stupid shit in the air but the real problem is the water and 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 what's going on with farming like look at all the agriculture that goes on all the way across turtle island north america all this all these waterways run down into the gulf of mexico mostly you know into the mississippi and stuff and all that water is dead because of the so much nitrogen right it's just artificially injected it's, it's wild because without it we're not feeding the we're not feeding the world and we're not growing the ethanol that's subsidized so so here we are or the ethanol we are growing is a net loss and it's an environmental catastrophe, right? It's 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 hey, like everything is worse. Everything can, they touch, they make worse. Maybe it's time to stop trusting them. You can paint it green, though. 
If you can paint it green right. if, with petrochemical paint, it's good for the environment. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about how we can use Azola to generate energy because what I really loved, listen, I don't even remember who, whose podcast I heard you on. I don't know if it was Snap or Nels or no, it was some girl DJ or something. Uh, uh, DJ yeah, DJ Val, she's, she's awesome. Yeah, yeah, DJ, DJ Val. Yeah, she was DJ Val. That's who it was. It was an awesome interview. But most of the things that you're talking about doing, it's not like, okay, so now what we need to do is we need to engineer a thing that will do the thing that does the thing that makes it work, right? It's like all the stuff that you need to do this. Maybe it's not doing this thing, but in pieces, parts, it's already on the shelf. Like a hammer mill and pelletizer already exists to make either feed pellets or compressed wood chips that people burn in a Traeger smoker. And uh, a, a, a gasifier that turns those into wood gas exists. And a generator that you plug into that exists. So how does how does a Zola fit into that? And how does the uh, the the proposal that you have kind of out in the open, like open source right now, Azeola, if I said it right, how does that how does all fit into that? No, so yeah, Azeola, it's just a word I made up. I sort of combined the Greek the Greek uh, word for life and, and Azeola into one word. Um, just, just for just for pure aesthetic reasons, created a little art art project around it, um, and so living power generation technology, which is what I sort of keyed, like I, I coined the term or whatever. I, I think that like there's a lot of bright people out there, and there's a lot of people with resources out there that 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 could make this happen. And so, like you said, it's all existing tech. It's things that already exist and they're accessible technology which is important it's not like fusion tech or something where it's like totally gate kept um and then we can uh we can sort of just like what what, what azuela is, is is just a call to action more than anything else and i want people to think deeply about these concepts and i want them to iterate on the process and if we could we could do a you know a, an actual crowdfunding campaign where we raise money and it's spearheaded and and we actually try to build something on 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 someone's land and, and do a, do a real project i mean i'm open for that opportunity as well that would be fun to do um but what's more important is that people actually just think about this and if, if they have the ability to to start to iterate on the process in some way and it, it's it essentially is going to involve um some form of like i said ecologically based i wrote i wrote a paper that, that summarizes everything you can check it out it's on twitter.com slash living power gen um it's the i think the pin tweet is the telegram group you can join there's also underneath that there's going to be a pdf uh, that may actually be the pin tweet but either way the pdf is, is the paper i wrote that summarizes the concept um and yeah ecologically based building materials so earth ship styled structures um, using hempcrete though instead of hempcrete forms i imagine instead of and tires would work better but there's experts in this that aren't me that would that would tell you what the best thing to do to build um to, to use to build these would be um and then growing uh an automation process designing some form of automation process so anyone who's like an engineer or understands these concepts like your uh, expertise would be beneficial but it would be nice to be able, I think it's possible to have some form of submergible tray um, that, you know, you just take up out of the water, 60% of the tray or something like that, and you dry it for a couple of days. You can recycle heat from the gasifier to dry the azola. Um, and then the azola loses a lot of biomass, as you know, once it's dried. Um, so it's just about how much area you can grow azola on to... Um, produce a certain amount of energy so it's it just there's some equation that i don't know what it is exactly yet but there's some magical equation that sort of nutrients to surface area to kilowatts um and and, and what what that equals so it just needs r d money pretty much at this point and it needs people that are interested in in pushing the concept forward um i'm working on other things personally now um i sort of put this concept out there and it, and it, and it exists in its form but um yeah, I mean that's that's the summary I think on on the on the on the living machine. <clears throat> it, it just requires yeah, gas fire pellet mill trays, you know, some form of of ducting and plumbing, things like that. 
Because one of the amazing things about Azola is how well it can utilize what we consider a waste product or a waste stream, uh, whether it be, like you said, a municipal clean food, uh, you know, like straight food type of thing. But I mean, here's an example. I have uh, one of my aquatic systems that I literally dump duck shit into the system and I control how much and when. And I don't do much of that this time of year because it's cold. So everything's a much more slow cycle. The Azola that's alive in there and living right now is very, very small um, in, in individual size of the individual plant. When we get into spring and the water warms up, like I said, up into the 70 degree range, and I start letting 50 gallons of water that has duck effluent in it into there every other day, the growth becomes absolutely freaking explosive. And if I cut the effluent, if I leave the temperature alone, and I cut that off, I, I start using that water maybe to water some trees or something for a while to watch what the results are. And that's why we need a lot of backyard experimentation. The growth doesn't stop, but it's not as that's explosive. That's the easy part. <laughs> literally turbocharge the growth rate by, by giving it a little bit mm -hmm. more warmth, keeping it from getting too hot. Like you said, it doesn't really like full sun. It likes nope. kind of, I wouldn't say shade. What it likes is modeled shade, like... It wants like, you know, like, like what you would get under like a 60% shade cloth in our summer. It, it, it's very, very happy. You give it full sun in my summer and it, it literally turns black and it, you think it's dead. It just goes away until it cools off. So there's like all these little tweaks that can be done to increase the yield and speed up the yield. But none of them require, oh, let's go mine some more rock phosphate full of uranium particles. Yeah, exactly. Florida, and make a leech pit out of it. It's going to last a thousand years of, of, of horrific damage. Like none yeah. of it requires any of that. No, no. And I think there's a water, like I said, water purification. I actually kind of, I got rabbit trailed. I forgot about this original point, but yeah. because you were mentioning that, I think there's actually, so Azolo likes, um, and I'm actually, I've never actually really hard. I've never cultivated any Azolo. I've done, I, this is all book knowledge for me. So I love talking yeah. to people that have actually done the cultivation uh, like yourself. But I know that there's a, a a certain water rate that like a flow rate that that Azola loves and it wants to flow at a certain speed. So if you can sort of find a way to automate that flow rate mm -hmm. with a harvesting method, um, sort of with a nutrient input and output, you could you could purify water like some of the toxins and heavy metals that are in water. You can actually purify it by adding it to this process. So I mean I don't know if that's really like a first priority or anything like that but there's i think places that would benefit from from this as, as a side effect because it takes up different things that are in the water right so things have multiple benefits when they're natural and they're all relevant and they're specifically relevant to the place that you're selling the idea so if that's what's important to the person that's approving a project or approving funding then that's your lead benefit Versus your lead benefit in another environment might be, hey, this stuff makes a lot of nitrogen. And, and and there's an important thing in that, too. So one of the people in the chat here was talking about how I will, I wouldn't want to put it in my aquarium then because I want the nitrogen, extra nitrogen in the form of nitrates and nitrites taken out. But the thing is, if you put a nitrogen fixer into a high nitrogen environment, it doesn't take all of that solar energy and say, hey, let's make nitrogen for the sake of making nitrogen. It takes that bioavailable nitrogen in whatever form it is out of the water. So the all of our nitrogen fixtures, whether they're legumes and terrestrial systems, these types of ferns and aquatic systems, they make nitrogen from the atmosphere in symbiotic relationships with bacteria when they need it. If you give it to them, they'll take it. So if we have excess nitrogen in a, in a water stream, we can pull that out. And you're right about flow. The plant itself doesn't really like to move very much at all. It likes to be still, but it likes kind of an underflow of water. So I grow it again in all these, these, these tanks. And I usually have like a large pond system in the ground. That's like a sump, the lowest part. And I grow different plants in there, but what we'll, where the Azola will dominate are the smaller tanks that are above that sump that water's flowing through at a very moderate rate, but yet the plant kind of fills out finds its place and it doesn't get disturbed by motion. I never really thought of that, even though I've observed it until you said that. And there probably is like, again, an optimal flow rate an optimal temperature rate an optimal nutrient rate that can be dialed in 
to a maximum yield. But again, we're, we're back to, I don't need to go mine rock phosphate. I don't need to do any of these things to get that. I just need to play with speed, exposure, temperature, time, and heat, which yeah. is really yeah. fascinating. Exactly. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's, it's it's quite a wild it's quite a wild plant. But you can see though, you know this plant, so you can see the potential of this in a modular closed loop like yeah. biosphere, right? And and then think of a, think of like what you were mentioning. You're like, oh, it's not spring yet, and the water's cold. Well, what if you took some Bitcoin miners and oh, then absolutely. you had them water cooled, and you brought that water, and then you transferred that heat over into your your grow water? You could see see the see the potential, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't know if it would work for my system. I don't know that I have the quantity. Right. Um, or the, the the system setup. But I see that working. I also see like even in a system like mine and then this like I'm a big believer on like we don't find a thing and then the thing is the thing and then it does all the things. Right. We find a thing and we plug it into something else. And I want to get into that modular word used in just a second. For But for example, I did a whole show yesterday. It was primarily based on the production of biochar and biochar having this incredible output that's good for uh, holding and building fertility, even though it's not a direct fertility, but also a huge heat output. So even in a, a system, then you could move in something like a bar, biochar production. Now yeah, you're it's also a result. A Bi- biochar is a result of the gasification process. So to produce the electricity, you're going to get um, biochar. Well, you're going to get charcoal, but if you can add that to the soil, create biochar, and then you have um, carbon sequestration. So theoretically, this system could could actually plug into Clown World and get subsidies from Clown World just from putting carbon in the earth. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing, right? So now you start to, to realize, like what I was talking about yesterday, is some of these big tech companies, they, they did all this crap with ESG and carbon offsets and carbon marketplaces, and they thought it was all what they wanted. And now they're like, well, wait a minute. We actually use a lot of energy. So there's not enough carbon offset out there for them. But the biochar is the best carbon negative offset that exists. So now you have they'll pay you to put it in the ground, ground right? <laughs> they'll literally just pay you to put it in the ground. It's it's pretty wild, actually. I've been looking into it. And yeah, I'm actually seeing that there's actually a large amount of money to be made just by burning, basically gasification and, and putting charcoal in the ground. There's money to be made. They're putting it in road bases because they don't. They literally don't care where it goes. They just know that it locks up the carbon for millennia. So if we don't have a place to put it in the ag, we'll put it into the wall of a building. We'll put it into a road base. And I think Microsoft right now has like bids out for more biochar and of the particular grade that they want. It doesn't exist. So there's like an unlimited market for biochar. And like, you're right. Like if you do the, the pelletization, when you're done with the gasification, what you're left with is, is a biochar and a very fine biochar, which means it doesn't have to be ground. But if you open up to the idea of bringing in cooperative systems and a modular program like you're discussing works great for that, then you open up the ability to use other feedstocks because we are, when it comes to biochar, we have no limitation on feedstock. We can, corn cobs make feedstock, waste parts of hemp product can be feedstock. Like, that starts to like the way these things then start working together. And I mentioned another plant called water hyacinth, also a very good livestock feed and even better for purifying water. So there, that's the thing about permaculture. You start to see this interconnected web and, and, and then you realize each of these are like these keystone components of these life webs. And yeah. the more we do to bring diversity or adaptability, certain plants maybe will do really well for us in the cool period and others in the warm period, for instance. And bro, you know what? This is the this is the base. So if we want to have any form of circular economy and any sort of form of free parallel economic activity, we need to have circular ecology that underlies and and basically is the structure that everything's built on, right? Circular ecology is the is the prerequisite for circular economy and you mentioned webs supply webs and and, and the future is shorter supply webs displacing longer supply chains and this is actually how we outcompete the cantillionaires because at the end of the day it really all boils down to market access and market share so it doesn't actually really matter if you can print money or not if you don't have market share so the real economic sort of trojan horse here is decentralized revolution 
through the uh, um, dissemination of, of local goods and services, we can actually displace long supply chains into short supply webs that have a permacultural base. Because again, without a native, um, uh, without, without, without basically a, a native source of nitrogen, you have to import something and you're not, you're not a, you're not a permaculture based supply web. So, so if, if we can fix that problem, then we can actually gain massive market share for quote unquote artisan producers. Right. And that's because there's actually a huge market share to be have. Go outside of a grocery store with a counter and count how many people go in in 12 hours outside of a grocery store. It's in the yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands of fucking people. Why is this happening? And no one goes to the strawberry stand, like right. 30,000 people drive by and one person stops because there's a disproportionate connect between the economic activity in an area and the actual dissemination of the goods and services. So that's the real revolution. The revolution is not political. The revolution is not fucking technological or any of that shit. It's really just socioeconomic. It's like socioeconomics. If we can solve the, 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 the like you said, the permaculture short supply webs to, to displace market access to plebs, then, then we'll have freedom and we'll have peace anarchy world peace all that stuff because what will happen is the state will just melt away because they'll lose the ability to purchase violence that's all so i have a theory too that part of the socioeconomic control of of fiat is to keep people just poor enough that they'll make a purchasing decision over a 10 percent price differential i i was doing some research into for instance how these different strains of corn maize were you know developed uh, in, in Mexico and how there's these, still all these really unique strains uh, of, of corn that are grown by these small local holders. But like, in a, you know, everybody and their brother eats tortillas on top of tortillas in, in these rural areas of Mexico. But the corn that comes in from the United States outcompetes a local produced corn that's grown across the street. But when you look at the actual price, your first inclination is who cares? Who, it's, it's, it's so small but that's because you're sitting in a position where you're not making a purchasing decision the way that individual is. You're not at, like deciding whether or not you're going to be able to feed your family for the whole month. And that fiat system, that unfair system where they can control inflation and, and basically let it get out. If it gets out of control, they, they win either way. They control it enough or they don't control it enough and they can always adapt themselves. And it keeps people in local economies from developing these circular economies because it keeps them just poor enough that you'll make a decision like instead of buying from my friend who I grew up with and went to school with, I'm going to Walmart because it's 15 percent less. Yeah. And not only 15 percent less, it's usually uh, it's also um, convenience. Convenience. Yeah. It's usually like accessibility is a large driver as well. Yeah, no, round, actually, I can get it year round. Like my like well, money yeah. produces the cornmeal. It's available for two months a year. I can like forget about the, my own responsibility to my family and go down and pick it up anytime I want to Walmart or whatever. Niche, fringe hobby, all these things, right? And like that's the problem right there. And and it's like, and you know what's worse? This is the worst part is if you talk to the community, okay, let's call it that, the space or whatever of artisan producers, small scale producers, these people producing quality. Okay. The people really producing value in our value scares economy, talk to them. And like, I give them credit because it, they, they look at, Oh, if I sacrifice quantity or a quality for quantity they're like, if they always think that is a trade-off, yep. it doesn't have to be. The only reason you see it that way is because of the Cantillion effect. And you think that you have to sacrifice qual quality for quantity, but you actually don't. In, in, a, in a real free market, you would have both quality and quantity as in a merit-based market. That's what would happen automatically because people want the best thing. So it, it, it actually is this weird self-fulfilling prophecy that people within that space, if you talk to them, they generally don't want a larger market share because they look at it as, oh, they're going to have to sacrifice something somewhere when it comes to cost. And that's where the poll decentralized sort of supply web comes in on the back end and makes all these things possible where like, like again, circular economy, you can't have it without the circular ecology 
to to base things on like the the rancher trying to grow his 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 following essentially needs he has costs to cover while he grows that 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 audience right yeah it's this weird thing that's actually what i've been spending all my time working on now is working on ways to increase market share for brands and how to build 100% efficacy behind marketing and advertisement by sort of backstreaming everything through bitcoin kickbacks like instead of instead of front loading advertising cost basically running advertising cost back in, in reverse through customer engagement through bitcoin kickbacks i think that that's that's a really good model for the future of, of ads and, and marketing so that's kind of what i'm working on right now and i'm also trying to work on community events where we do basically where I'm, it's basically where we're, we're, we're creating a group event where you pay to go to the event it's an upfront charge to go to the event and it's perceived as like an elite social event you know no phones kind of thing and that process is actually the um you have a, we have a live animal a live bison and we do um we're going to do like a a, a harvesting we're going to honor the animal recognize the animal harvest the animal process the animal prepare the animal um preserve the animal you know all these things and then we're, gonna, we're actually going to have a feast around the animal where you have enough people to come together and all participate in the process from the animal's life to 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 actually you know eating the animal and i want to reconnect large groups of people with the spiritual process of, of eating food um, and in that process creates create local networking hubs because it'll be a way to come and showcase your products right if you sell if you're a, a weed producer you're like a licensed weed producer and you grow weed your small scale craft wherever there's no way to promote your product legally but you can bring it to an event and share it with your friends right sure. or if you're gross cider you make cider or something like there's no legal way to promote these things outside of these curated events where there's like vendors and participants and then all the rent seeking organizations in between and, and finding a way to circumnavigate all those rent seekers and creating these events because we can do it on, on reservation land and we can sort of, you know, tell health Canada to get fucked. But nonetheless, it's going to be hopefully a bit of a, a bit of a, um, an awakening. That's what I'm working on these days. It's going to be all in Toronto area. Um, and then we're going to, uh, yeah, that, like, that's the future, man. Like all these sort of things like building the decentralized revolution. Um, can you before we go into this because I know you've got uh, kind of a company working on this kind of ad brand model and all. I don't want to skip over something I think is really important that we talk about today, and that is if you can if you can build a system like this with a Zola potentially as one of your fuel stocks, or no matter how you do it, if we can actually create a way that we're producing energy at at a higher value than it cost us to produce it without bringing in these massive inputs from elsewhere. It's a huge boon to any impoverished society to be able to have a monetary creation for their own ecosystem locally like Bitcoin. What does that mean to a society to be able to actually take, create surplus energy and harvest that surplus energy into a hard money like Bitcoin? I think it puts a return on investment, puts an ROI on energy, which is sort of wild. So that means you can look at the cost of, of, of energy and you can say, well, it costs this much to build the infrastructure that's going to produce our energy. Not it costs this much to create this energy and we're going to measure the energy it's almost like the 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 old premise of Thomas Edison, right? Where he was like, "Oh, well, we're gonna have to patent that AC thing there," you know, because 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 that's they really don't want you to have free energy or not free energy. They don't want you to have that's the wrong word. I hate that word. It's not free, but uh, they don't want you to have truly renewable energy they don't want you to have a cost like a return on investment where you can go okay we're going to build energy infrastructure and then we're going to reap the benefits of that in the same way that you build a permaculture system there's a cost involved and there's a time investment all these things and then once it's built then generations seven generations will reap the benefits of the permaculture system that you've built and i think that that's what it does it changes the time preference of a society significantly because they know that there's a return on that investment it's not an ongoing cost it's not the burden of 
of of of s- slavery, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We've we've talked about continuing effect here quite a bit, and for those that maybe are new to the show and not familiar with that, what we're talking about basically is that the closer someone is to the money faucet, the less the money costs, the more they benefit, right? So when we have a private organization of banks creating money and giving it to themselves, basically, or uh, giving it at extremely low interest to people that are one off, and then basically reselling the money, you can see how that would be advantageous. You've hit on something a couple of times here about shortening the supply chains. I don't have a word for it yet, but it has me bouncing around like a version of that effect that the people that are closer to the source and the supply chain, if we structure circular economies right, they become far more resilient and far less non-brittle to the effects of the global system, if that makes sense. Like there is something there with getting closer to the production of the item because now we don't have the cost in energy and time and money to move the thing. And then Bitcoin fits in there to me because it's weightless. It's, it's, it's money that can move at the speed of light. It's programmable money. So Bitcoin's immune to the distance. And if we can make the supplies, you know, far less sensitive to the distance, then we really have something for parallel economies. Yep. Yeah. I think that's, so it's, it's, it's in the Bitcoin, you mentioned it. It's, it's a really uh, critical part to this because when you're close to the supplier, then the supplier has intrinsic value. And when the supplier has intrinsic value, the supplier can say, actually, you know, don't actually pay me with your credit card. You know, I don't want to actually pay 5% processing and this and this and that and blah, 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 and lose chronic money to this and that. I actually want you to pay me over lightning. Okay. So I want you to go to, you know, I want you to go to this website. I want you to download this, this wallet. And, and, and basically like in Canada, we have it really easy. Shout out to bull Bitcoin and bills. They make everything really super seamless. Like you can send somebody as a vendor. You can be like, okay, uh, you know, I'm producing, um, artisan products. They have a specific demand. All my, like you have your market access already. Um, you can easily say, well, I actually don't take cash anymore. I only take Bitcoin and it's not going to, you know, your business won't suffer because the process for these people is like they send an email transfer essentially to the exchange. The exchange sends the money directly into their wallet. They put it on their, you know, say like blue wallet or something. They put it into their lightning and they send it right to you and you have it within like max two hours. You know, that's easier than invoicing something traditionally, to be honest, you can do it over like a messaging app. You can do it over text. And so I think that like creating uh, the incentive for vendors to go, it's actually more convenient for me just to accept Bitcoin for my products than it is like, I don't mean in the daily, like someone's buying a $3 coffee. We're not there yet. If everyone's not already holding Bitcoin, but I'm saying like for all the invoicing for the suppliers, you know, why the yeah. suppliers are going to be really the ones who drive it because it's going to be so much easier than getting a fucking square thing or whatever those things are, you know. I don't know. You know all these ways that people use to accept um, is usually just invoicing and bank transfers and all this stuff. So, like, I think all that, all that economic overhead will quickly go over into like hot wallets and stuff. And then, like, the next step is people understand, okay, well, then how do you actually custody this stuff? How do you run a node? How do you verify your transactions? How do you, you know, put this stuff properly away where no one can get it? And this actually allows people to build a parallel economy that isn't on the wrong side of the state either. Like, that's important to recognize. If you want something to flourish, you can't, like, go on the aggressive so pay your taxes people like don't don't try to dodge that shit don't look at bitcoin and be like well i can't transaction bitcoin because then i'm gonna have capital gains taxes but like yeah if you if you gain you will for sure so try to like structure your economic activity in a way that you can utilize bitcoin actually as a as a tax haven um and legally pay your taxes when they're due because you use bitcoin as a form of property um acquisition essentially right don't look at it as like you're buying bitcoin and you got losses and gains on on the speculation of bitcoin look at as you're going to acquire bitcoin as a side effect of your economic process and if you don't realize that into into dollars yet then it's not economic gain yet until you do that so you know structure your costs and things accordingly and and you can you can effectively be on the right side of the law be paying your taxes appropriately and transacting in bitcoin because like 
yeah, you should pay transactional tax when you when you pay in Bitcoin because it's a barter exchange, you know. So you should do these things. You should you should pay the tax man his whatever percent on every transaction. You should do those things because that's what allows the parallel economy to flourish. And then as a result, then you really can defund the state because 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 you have the 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 network effect, right? That's what Bitcoin is: the separation of money and state. And, and if the just third to be clear world, here for my audience, which is mostly U.S., you're talking about Canadian tax laws, and our tax laws are slightly different. And so oh, in the yeah. U.S., if I spend Bitcoin, I have effectively sold it. So if if I it gets complicated, you can manage by UTXO or what they call first in, first out. But there's a loophole for us that's it's incredible and allows us to spend Bitcoin over on chain or Lightning almost instantly. And for now, the best provider for that is Strike. And I don't, I don't think they're available in Canada yet. But if I want to buy something from somebody and, there's, and they take Bitcoin, what I do is I open my Strike app and I deposit the amount I want to spend in U.S. dollars. They then show me a QR code for either a Lightning invoice or for an on-chain Bitcoin transaction, depending on what they want. I never buy Bitcoin. I scan that and I hit send and they get Bitcoin. They're just using the monetary rails. Yeah, no, that's right. beautiful. That's a cool, that's a cool little workaround for the States. I mean, in Canada, like I said, we have, I, I, I shout out again, both Bitcoin and bills. We have a way for that. You can actually with bills, you can do a transaction and like the tax uh-huh. man gets, gets their 13% per se in, in, in Ontario off yeah. of the transaction that goes directly to the Canadian revenue agency's bank account in the central bank of Canada. They just like, boom, they get that money instantly. So you're actually like, you're actually paying tax on the moment of transaction. Isn't that wild? Like actually it makes your tax um like the ability to 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 run your taxes and stuff on your business. That's actually, like a VAT tax, I guess they call it in the UK yeah. Europe, a value added tax on every transaction, right? We have sales taxes here that work, but only at the final point of sale. But it's the same principle. So you yeah. could in theory because having run, like I don't like to run physical product businesses anymore. I'm a one man show. It's extra headache and work. Uh, but having done that in the past, like especially if you sell into multiple different jurisdictions, sales tax is a real pain in the ass. But if you could automate sales tax without having to file any paperwork, that would be an incentive enough alone to take Bitcoin and only Bitcoin as long as you had the market to do it from. Because if they just got their money and left you alone, even though I don't want to pay them, it's better than having to do work to pay them. Yeah, yeah, you can 100% do that with like a BTC pay server, for example. You could automate yeah. the whole whole system, um, at least in Canada, like using the bill service. I think they're working on an international model, so I'm not too, I'm not too sure what's going on there. But and they also offer kickbacks and stuff too. So when customers want to like buy new people want to sign up to buy Bitcoin, they give like a kickback to the people that sent them there. <clears throat> so that means that vendors can be like, hey, buy buy in Bitcoin, and we'll give you a discount if it's your first time, right? And that's actually like on the back end through like the exchanges incentive program. So there's all sorts of like cool ways to integrate Bitcoin into the, into the local community and show people how it's actually a convenient model. Like there's a lot of people on Twitter (laughs) these days arguing with me, shout out those people. They know who they are, but saying that like mass adoption is a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. And like, nobody's going to actually learn how to properly use Bitcoin and self custody their keys and do all these things and all that stuff. And, and it'll always just be like a fringe thing for the for the fringe, and we don't need the masses. Have they paid attention for the last ten years when they're saying that? Just to look at the <laughs> like, rate. It's gonna happen, but True. it's it, it, it has to happen if we don't want CBDCs to take over. Because under a CBDC model, you can't actually buy Bitcoin anymore because it's a personalized programmable token. It doesn't. It does. It's not a bearer asset. So there's there, there's like levels to this shit that like this is the time to push Bitcoin into the peer to peer economy and make it a convenience product. Like not even a product, just a convenient bearer asset, the most convenient means of value exchange. That's what it needs to become uh, quickly because that's what CBDCs will be offered as, as convenience. They're not going to come through and be like mandated or anything like that. They, They won't be, they'll be convenience products. I, I think one of the biggest problems with the reason they want a CBDC it, people are so worried about tracking and, and controlling what you can and can't buy. And that's a huge concern, but there's actually a bigger thing Th- what they want to do is actually put for, not for them, but for you and me, an expiration date on our money. 
See, we've been selling college students for multiple generations now the, the idea that people who save their money are evil and that money's no good unless it's circulating in the economy and actually building wealth by holding money is bad. So they actually, like, especially if they move toward like a UBI, you would get your UBI. Let's say they give you 3,000 space credits or 2,000 or 100, whatever it is, right? If you don't spend it by a certain time, it evaporates and disintegrates and goes away. You, you talk about not owning your own money. There's nothing that could be more not owning your own money. Than not, they just don't lock it up or shut you out. It. You can't it's spend just it either. It's annihilated into oblivion. It's just gone. And, and to spend it, it has to be like an approved transaction to an approved yes. acceptor for an approved purchase. Yeah. Right? It's all like you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to give you my space credits, 10,000 space credits for your Bitcoin. Like it's not going to work that way because you, then those space credits are now null and void. You can't, there's nothing for you to transfer to the other person. Correct. It's not there. Or, or like you said, you have it, but I can only spend it with the people they say I'm allowed. Or, I mean, it could get really advanced to where they say, well, you know, Jack, you used a little bit too much energy this this month. You can spend your money on you these things, but not those things, even though normally you could have bought those things, but not this month because your carbon footprint's too big. Jack, you grew a Zola, deducted space credits, prohibited, prohibited plant. <laughs> Good luck with that, because I, I've been building my wealth outside of that system for a long time. And I think that other people's other folks really need to take that seriously. I'll just throw out a little uh, pitch here that uh, coming up on uh, just a few days from now, really uh, next month, I will be doing from February 6th through 10th, a uh, five day series being run by John Bush with other experts. And we're going to be talking specifically about how to opt out of this CBDC nightmare using Bitcoin. So I'll just throw that again. It'll be in the show notes. I want to move on and talk about 21 percenters and, and what that is, this ad brand model and an attempt to kind of curate and lead us toward mass adoption of Bitcoin. What's that all about? So um, yeah, 21 percenters is <clears throat> concept I'm working on. Um, actually, no, I haven't really launched it technically fully yet. Um, Anyone uh, can DM me, though, if they're interested in, in, in participating. Oh. If you have anything to sell or, or, or any services, things like that you want to promote, send me a DM on Twitter and uh, and we'll make it happen. Um, and we can basically launch it with whatever. But basically, the concept is, you know how there's like, in advertisement, there's a there's a front cost, there's a front loaded cost, mm -hmm. uh, and that goes to like let's just say the billboard company, for example. Okay, uh, the billboard company is going to host your your ad. They're going to charge you X amount for the ad, and you hope to get so many so many views, right? From those views, you have like a um, conversion ratio, um, which basically is is your efficacy rate, which is very low. Um, generally advertisement today, efficacy rate is like one to 3%. It's very, very low. And that number inches up from data harvesting. <clears throat> so that's kind of like where all the innovation has gone in advertisement in the last decade or whatever has been in how they can target the ads the best. So instead of generic billboards, they want to get like, you were talking to your friend about Hershey's or whatever, and now they pick that up and they want to, Promote her. We're losing you, dude. Don't hear you. Hello. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. My, I think I put my finger on the microphone. I apologize. All right. You were talking about like your friend tells you about Hershey's. Yeah, basically just like uh, targeted ads. That's the core. Everything's gone. Um, but but there's they're not really what they're not doing is tracking the efficacy rate of 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 customer engagement. The best thing you have is affiliate marketing in the form of, you know, you're promoting something through your podcast, for example, like what you're doing, you promote a product and then you have a, uh, like a referral code that gives like a incentive for the customer to engage with your referral code. Right. That's basically the engagement protocol is their discount. Um, and, or just affinity for, for you as the, as the, um, as the promoter essentially. <clears throat> so, that kind of works, but you only have so much ad space, right? You have to pick and curate which ones you're going to promote based on the amount of um, value 
that they're actually giving the amount of um, volume that they can potentially bring. Right. And so it's limited. Um, and then it also um, sort of, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily work as well as, as the traditional way, which is like getting, it doesn't get the range quite out there as, as, as much. Right. <clears throat> so I'd say the best iteration is also uh, affiliate marketing. So what we're trying to do with 21 percenters is construct a model that <clears throat> essentially creates different channels, a, a, an engagement protocol that is, that uses um, like three layers. So broadcast channels, this is a really good use case for Noster. Um, so to begin, we're going to just use Telegram because Telegram is accessible um, and it's already it's already there. Everyone knows how to use Telegram. Um, but in the future, we're going to build this on parallel on some form of Noster. Um, and the Noster protocol is definitely the future of communications <clears throat> in general and, and, and also commerce. So definitely everything will move there eventually. But I'm not like totally like I, I, I have like a public key on there, but I'm not. I would say Noster is today where Lightning was four and a half years ago. Yeah, it's early. It's very yeah, early. Yeah, yeah. early. Yeah. So it's eventually, nerd that, land right now, and I'm not the nerd to go that far. I, I don't either. have that ability. <laughs> exactly. Me neither. Um, but yeah, no, I know for sure that's where it will go in the future. Um, and then, so basically, proof of engagement via purchases, posts, membership, etc., things like that, and then just Lightning wallets or Lightning invoices. So we're gonna ask people they use something like Blue Wallet, um, but you know, like most like lightning wallets will work it's just we want reliability right on the liquidity for for the for the lightning so that's why we let's say like just download something like blue wallet use a use a hot lightning wallet for the for, for the process because you're not storing your net worth on here it's just for it's just for transacting right mm -hmm. um so uh then so so basically broadcast channels is the is the main premise um there's different types of broadcast channels we're gonna have like the ad brands made broadcast channel um the ad brand will have also a catalog channels so what we're trying to do is build a sort of database of promoters or of vendors sorry um and so if you have something to sell and you you are you have a good or service to to promote um you just create a a, a channel and you have access to the channel, you edit the channel, you make the promotions or whatever it is. So whether the promotions come in different forms, right? So the promotions will be <clears throat> um, basically kickbacks in the form of purchases on the on, purchases, social media posts or referrals. So basically like a company can say, we're going to give, you know, $2 for every, uh, for every referral whatever it is, I don't know, it's a random number, but like $2 for every referral or every time you post on social media with our hashtag, we're going to give you two bucks for it. Or if you buy our product, we'll give you 30% back, 50% back, 60% back, whatever the, whatever it is, it's up. It's completely up to the vendor. One. It's totally it could be thing. 1%. It could be 80%. It could be anything. Right? Yeah, it could, yeah. It doesn't matter. It's like one time reoccurring. doesn't matter. It's like totally open format, whatever it is. But, but, but the vendor puts out what their promotion is, what their offer is. It's some form of sats back offer. And if they can't offer sats back, for example, the Canadian cannabis industry, which is something I'm tar trying to target with this, it's highly regulated. And you're not allowed to promote cannabis products. You're not allowed to promote cannabis consumption or purchase or any of, that, any of that. And you certainly can't incentivize it, right? So you can't give Bitcoin back for like sats back on cannabis is like, go to jail, go to jail, go straight to jail. Don't collect $200. Like it's like highly prohibited. So uh, like... To, to circumnavigate that you can do well for example if you're a if you're a storefront you can host your um your storefront on a billboard right you can promote your, your billboard the location the phone number and the and the in the website when you go to the website it has a government approved age wall right where you have to type in your birth date or say you're 19 or whatever it is super super secure you know because if you're under 19 you don't you can't calculate what what year you were born or anything like that yeah so, yeah i got you <laughs> but basically as long as it does that it's okay if it's under the parameters right so you can be a billboard company you can be paid to promote cannabis or you can be a radio program or radio show or whatever paid to promote cannabis but you're not promoting cannabis you're just promoting the government approved storefront so so <clears throat> essentially what we're trying to do is step in as a sort of like a disseminated billboard and say hey you know, promote your products on this, promote your website, essentially, in your storefront on this channel. That's all they can do. They can't put specific offers or anything like that. 
And yeah. then what will happen is it'll be a member. It's a broadcast channel where people subscribe or follow or whatever, if it's on Noster and you have, you have like a basically a provable list of memberships and that's like the engagement protocol. So then you can track the engagement with that. Or if you don't want to give sats back, you're just a stingy business. You don't feel like giving sats back. Like that's another option, I guess, for you. Um, so then th- that sort of is like another way that we're going to have it. But other than that, just proof of membership, um, or sorry, sorry, proof of purchase, proof of social media post, or, or whatever the it's protocol kind of is. proof of work in a way, whatever the, uh, the vendor wants to offer as an incentive, whether it's uh, you purchase and get sats back, or I refer and I get a piece of the purchase price, or I'm an influencer and you're willing to pay me a certain amount for a post, whatever it is, uh, you basically have uh, a, a, an automated system that checks and ensures that what was claimed to have been done was done and that what was promised to be paid is paid. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's so- taken to like a, almost like a protocol level so that it's, it's very anti-fragile against the state because it's just software. Well, right? not even like, software, just, it's just people talking to each other. So like sure. I'm saying we use telegram now, but this could be Noster. This could be like, we're shouting at each other out of windows. Like it doesn't really matter. It's just kind of the, the concept is it's just dissemination of information. So the value proposition of 21 percenters is just basically management of proof of engagement gotcha. and management of invoices so that you're not chronically having to take in all these engagement posts and, and engagement proofs and then send out invoices individually to all these people. It'll just be like, we sort of aggregate that. And then as a vendor, you'll get a scheduled invoice with, all audible proofs of engagement. So you can check the memberships on the channel. You can check each individual post or proof if you really want to. Um, you don't have to trust us, but you can trust us. And you just pay one invoice. And the one invoice is basically all of your engagement aggregated. So you'll go to the exchange. You'll buy the amount of Bitcoin. You'll send it to us right away. You don't give a crap what the price of Bitcoin is. You're not speculating on Bitcoin. We'll take that Bitcoin. We send it out to all the individual promoters that are responsible for each promotion. And we send it to the, to the, to the people that, in, that are a part of the engagement, like the customer or whatever it is. And so that's just where our value placement is. We're just disseminating information essentially. Um, and for promoters, they have the opportunity to basically choose from our catalog of different promotions and then just kind of link those to their own promotion channel. So now as a podcaster, for example, instead of ad reads, you just say a value read. You go, hey, check out my broadcast channel, my 21 percenters broadcast channel, whatever. You don't have to say 21 percenters. Just check, check out my broadcast channel, my ad broadcast channel. You go there and it basically lists everything. So you've chosen vendors that are uh, appropriate for your audience in the same way you are now. So this works better than targeting ads because it's it's aggr- it's natural aggregation because you as a, as a um, content producer – your real value as a producer, as a producer is to connect with your audience. So if you're doing that well, then you, then you you know what your audience wants, right? So <clears throat> the products you're going to promote will have a high engagement uh, rate most likely. And, um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, they know if they go to that channel and engage with your promotions, they're going to get value in some way return for that, right? They know that you're offering value for value. It's a value for value proposition. So instead of a a cringy ad read, like which many podcasters do, you can just do like a quick, hey, go check this out. There's value to be had. Move on with your show. And then now you can get way more potential revenue from that small bit of, of space because you can pack in infinite ads essentially because you can just choose any of these vendors and then whatever they're promoting at the time, you don't even have to manage the promotions because the vendors are automatically doing that themselves from their broadcast channel. So that's sort of the value for promoters is the ability to aggregate promotions into one link and, and, and sort of cut out the cringy ad reads and all that stuff in physical form. That looks like QR codes in the form of what we call sticker channels, where the purpose is instead of a bunch of different promotions, it's like one individual promotion with one single engagement protocol. So it's like, hey, if you go here and you buy this thing, you send a proof of purchase with this broadcast channel link, you get this much Bitcoin back kind of thing. And then you can mass print those out and put them on like freaking drive throughs or whatever you want as a, as a, you know, if you're just somebody coming up trying to build a business, all it costs you is, is printing a bunch of stickers, print a hundred stickers, whatever. And hopefully you get some return on that. And then on that sticker, what you can do is you can create a gorilla effect where you can say, 
hey, on top of this, if if you don't want to buy one, you can actually create your own sticker channel. And then now you can sort of be like a template basically. And then you can promote my product and you're going to get a kickback every time someone buys from your thing. So now you have two, four, eight, you know, 16, 32, like you have that effect sort of happening on your sort of guerrilla advertising effect. That's hopefully what that leads to. Um, and then there's also another role, which is the the recruiter. So all these vendors need to know about it and they need to be able to like run a channel and pick promotions. So they have to like be onboarded. They don't necessarily have to be orange pilled, but they have to understand how to engage and acquire Bitcoin and what the purpose is of why they're buying Bitcoin and sending Bitcoin and how all the like lightning channel works and all that stuff. Like they, they need to have a little bit of a walkthrough. They also need to be like incentivized. Hey, this is zero risk advertisement. You put up a channel, you put whatever you want up there, potentially hundreds or thousands of promoters promote your products and you get however many views on your products and you never have to pay a dime unless those views convert. It's incremental revenue, right? It's you're only paying for the conversion or you're only paying for the action. Yep. You're not throwing up advertising because most, especially small businesses, they don't really know how to advertise. So most of the money spent on advertising has a negative ROI. Yeah. And so it's a safeguard. Like you have training was you can keep trying shit till you figure out what works. But it sounds like you got a lot of work to do, but I'm excited about the concept because we're talking about data and we can aggregate data into any format. So for instance, right now, my podcast goes on your Spotify's and your Apple's and all that stuff, but it also goes into value for value on other platforms like Fountain and with the value for value integrations with RSS feeds. I don't do this because I don't think it's that valuable yet. But I know podcasters, for instance, that as you're listening to their podcast, you're not seeing video, but different images show up on your podcast player. Well, those could be QR codes. They could be all types of things. So once this is data, it can be disseminated through Adam Curry's Value for Value Network via Podcast Index, for instance. And I could be promoting something that by the very fact that I'm promoting it, my audience knows that I obviously think well of it or I wouldn't do it. But at the same time, I can spend very little time actually talking about it. So we're almost done. So, for instance, when you sign off, I'm going to promote my product of the day that comes out of the Amazon marketplace. Is it because I love Amazon? No, it's because I do have to pay the bills. It's because they do pay their bills and it's because they have everything. And if it's something I actually own and use, I'll recommend it. But it will take time. It will be an inconvenience for the listener unless they're interested in that particular thing. But the more you can channelize this stuff into data that's aggregatable, no matter where you're at, whether it's a social media that doesn't exist yet because it's going to be built on Nostr someday or something that will aggregate through uh, really simple syndication, which is what RSS is, through podcast mediums and who knows what else. Then you're actually having this marketplace that is as programmable as Bitcoin as this programmable money. So that's very exciting. It just sounds like you have a long way to go with it right now. Yeah, we're we're super early, but the goal mostly is just to eliminate the rent seeking of advertisement because right now it's currently a cost to vendors that has really low returns, but if they don't pay it, they lose any marketplace that it's going to get them. So it it turns into like really really expensive rent in a shitty apartment. It's kind of what a lot of advertisement is for most vendors. So we just want to increase efficacy to 100% and then actually how much reach we have, well, that's variable. That will grow as the network grows. So, yeah, it's, it's super early, the concept. But I believe that because of Bitcoin, specifically the Lightning Network and the accessibility, the downstream effect of this and how this affects mass adoption is now you have people acquiring Bitcoin as an auxiliary of their daily lives just by purchasing things that they would or looking basically shopping for deals because if you look at the catalog racks at any box stores they're always empty because people actually go out of their way to get those things and leave them in carts and everything because they actually produce value right for them so they they, they, they want to look and see what's relevant so people will seek this stuff out and this is the best part about it it's value not attention based so instead of fighting for your attention, hey, look at this advertisement and throwing you the stupid ad that's not even relevant to the product, now you actually can create real value ads where vendors can run long form ads where they can break a product down and describe it because they're not fighting for your attention. 
Correct. You're, you're paying it. You're, it's it's pull versus push. Yeah, because if I see one more pharmaceutical ad with a 70s reformatted jingle, I'm going to snap my own neck. I mean, really, it's it, and that's what everything's become is cramming everything at the consumer. The consumer uh, wants awareness and then they will see greater awareness of the things that pique their interest. Anyway, this has been really cool, man. Um, I do have uh, from your guest form, all, like your, your Twitter, your Telegram, uh, Living Power Gen as well, 21% or stuff. I've got everything. And for anybody watching this, if you go look in the video notes, you'll just see a link. And it goes over to where the audio notes shall be very soon. We, if we are live yet, it's not. we're not done yet, so it's not there yet. Uh, but the audio will go out about one hour after the uh, live form of this video wraps up. And Moses, dude, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think we've covered maybe more stuff in this hour and 50 minutes than we generally cover in two shows. It's been all over and in the best way possible. Thank you for being with us today. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been it's been a really good conversation. It, it was actually it was it was really inspiring to see when I saw your invitation. You were like, "Oh, I have grown a Zola for like eight years." I was yeah. like, "No freaking way! This is amazing." So yeah, yeah, dude, it's an uh, awesome conversation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Again, thanks for being here, and uh, we'll have you back anytime when you have something you want to chat about. Folks, with that wrapped up, I just want to remind you guys really quick, there's a couple of ways you can support this show if you find value in it. One is you can get on a value for app, value podcasting app like Fountain.fm, or there's many other ones available out there. And you can send us some stats. You can stream while you listen, or you can boost us. And if you send me a boostergram, I just might read it on air. I haven't been doing that lately, uh, but I will start doing that again very, very soon. I can't read them all or the whole show would be booster ramps. You can also join my member support brigade. We were talking about discounts there. Uh, you can get discounts on all types of really awesome stuff, mostly from very small businesses, some with people I've been working with for a very long time. Just about all my sponsors do some sort of discount as well. It's 50 bucks a year, but you might be able to get a sale price. If you just went to the Survival Podcast, Scroll down until you see my resources from my recent presentation down in Bastrop, Texas at the Greater Reset. There might be a discount code in there. I'm just saying you might want to check. And, of course, we have our item of the day. These are all things that I recommend, and I recommend them because I actually use them. I No, I took it with me to Bastrop, so it's still in my bag. Uh, this is one that I have found to be one of the coolest little items especially when it goes on a sales price at 25% off like it is today. It's made by a company called Anker, A-N-K-E-R. Uh, they are the best value electronics brand I have found. This thing is fully waterproof. Yes, I put it in the shower just to find out if it met the claims. It's about 30 bucks when it's on sale like it is right now. Full charge will take you for 24 hours. It just works really good. And two of them pair together. I have like a full badass AV system in my main shop where I run my workshops. I got a drop down screen, overhead projector, great big professionally installed speakers and all. But in my back shop where I actually do most of the work, I, I don't have all that. I don't want to duplicate it out there. I have two of these out there. And it's a great sound system for listening to podcasts and educational material or just some music while I'm out there working, uh, putting stuff together, building projects and things like that. My son has these. If I recommend it to my kid, you know that I will recommend it to you. And remember, everything that I recommend can be found on a page on my website. You can get there with a short URL, tspaz.com, T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. Go there. You'll find all the stuff I recommend. There's over 300 personally reviewed products by me. I spent my money on it. I'd do it again, or it wouldn't be there, even though it is the big, bad Amazon.com. Most of us use them. And again, I recommend only products that I personally use there. With that, I hope you enjoyed today's show. I certainly enjoyed the conversation that I had with Moses today. Uh, I think, we, again, we covered a lot of ground. If you came to this from the Bitcoin side of things, you're like, boy, that took a while for him to get there. But you're intrigued. If you want to know more about building true personal liberty, building true interactive circular economies, function stacking, permaculture, growing your own food, alternative energy, growing in greenhouses, all the kind of stuff we talked about today or alluded today, making biochar like we covered yesterday. You need to tune into this show regularly, not just for the Bitcoin episodes. And uh, we have been running for 14 and a half years. We're available at thesurvivalpodcast.com. Or if you don't want to type in that many letters, you can also use tspc.co 
If you think that doesn't sound like a real domain, try it just to see if it works. TSPC.co. With that, it's been Jack Spierko with another episode of the Survival Podcast.